guess I'll get started. Uh, my name is Kevin Schultz. Um, I'm an Android developer at Guild Group. Um, this is, uh, hold on a second, let me, this? This is my Twitter account and blog and GitHub. Um, specifically, the GitHub link is to an example app uh, that illustrates a lot of things I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'll have that link up in the middle and at the end, so you don't need it right now if you don't want. Um, but it, it should show a lot of things I'm going to go through, and there will be code um, in the talk. Um, I definitely want to start by thanking everyone for still being here at the end of the day. Um, it's been a long day, but I'll definitely try to keep the, the energy up. Um, okay, so maintainable applications. I want to start by thinking about where you want to live. And my analogy here is a tent and a house. You measure these two things by very different metrics. When you go on a camping trip, you bring a tent, and you're measuring it by how lightweight it is, how quick you can set it up, break it down, how it fits in your backpack. That's all well and good, but that's not where you want to live. You know, you want to live in a nice house that's going to be sturdy, it's going to stand for years, it's not the lightest thing, it doesn't fit in a backpack very well. But those aren't the metrics you're measuring it by. Um, and when we're thinking about the apps that you're building, you really have to answer the question, you know, what is the goal? Are you building a weekend project that you're going to put 30 hours into the next month and then walk away from? You know, the way I'm experimenting with material design or, you know, some new Google Fit API. These are throwaway experiments. They're tense. You know, the apps that I work on day to day, this is something that I'm going to be involved in and the team that's working on it will be involved in even after I'm gone. It's a different set of criteria, a different way of thinking about uh, what you're building. So this talk is about what your app will feel like on its first birthday. If you put a year into an app every single day, you and the team that you work on, what does that app feel like at the one year mark? Um, and all too often at one year, everyone's looking around at each other and it feels like you're treading water. You're not spending the time that you want to on new features for customers, you're spending it all fixing bugs. Your release are getting less and less frequent because every single time you need three, four days of QA and there's always that last minute bug. And you get highs and bugs. You can't reproduce them. They come out of left field. Somebody re reports it. You spend a week chasing down some threading issue that you can't figure out. Um, and there's just a general fear. There's a fear that any major change is going to cause the whole house of cards to collapse. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Six months, a year in, you hit this um, at some point if you don't you know, try to avoid it. Um, but it gets worse because we're on mobile. So the platform changes completely underneath you. Um, iOS 7 was a major driver in the iOS world for a lot of basically software bankruptcy. Um, material design might be that for some people. If you're in a startup, your business might pivot, you need to change your app completely or you're gonna not make money and, you know, lo and behold, you can't drive that software in that direction. Um, your competitors come out, they have some nice UI that you don't have, they're more performant than you, they, they have all these extra features, how do you keep up? And then you just panic. Your engineering team, you know, we can't keep up, this thing is a mess, uh, there's only one solution, and, uh, sorry, this is the material design bit. Um, there's only one solution, and it's to rewrite the whole damn thing. Um, and then someone says, you know, that's crazy, we put nine months into it, we can't rewrite the whole thing, let's just refactor it for two months, and everything will be great. Um, and if somebody's dumb enough to approve that, you probably do that. Um, you convince that the reason why it's a problem right now, your code base is a mess. I read these books. I'm not going to be like the last guy who wrote it, even if the last guy was me when I was younger. Like, this time, it's going to be different. Um, it's unlikely to be different. Even if you get the opportunity to rewrite it or refactor it, even if you have that budget and those resources, I'm telling you right now, it's unlikely to be different if all you're going to do is write cleaner code. Uh, because clean code is necessary, but it's insufficient for having a maintainable application uh, over a long period of time. And even if you catch up to today, that's just today. What about next year? You haven't solved the problem in the long term. Um, and you know, this begs the question, why do Android apps, although I'll throw iOS apps in as well, why do these always seem to end up um, as a bear? You know, there's a lot of great companies in New York, great engineers, working on these things full time, and every time you turn around, one of these major companies is talking about rewriting their app. Um, I don't think that's a failure of the engineers. That seems like a systemic problem to me. Um, so my first, this is a little bit of a blame slide, but it's not really a complaint slide, it's more about, like, let's be honest about the reasons why we're getting in this situation. Um, Android, in my opinion, was originally built for apps, calculators, stopwatches, you know, like, 
all those kind of small scale things. And when you go talk to the teams out there that are three, four, five guys, um, they're building really large applications that I don't think Android was initially built for. Um, you know, the original build system, whether it was Ant or ADT, didn't even have dependencies. Um, you know, the, the testing tools are minimalistic. Uh, a lot of the frameworks are singletons. Uh, it's very difficult to really inject your own account manager in, things like that. It just wasn't thought of in the initial uh, system. And in the beginning, performance really trumped everything. You, you see that where there's you know, no enums coming out of the system. It's all in constants. And now we have annotations and the support library to help with that. But that was really putting performance of static constants over you know, the readability and maintainability of enums. And look at all the strings we pass around. And look at all the times we're writing things to bundles. This was all you know, designed to squeeze the last 5% out instead of build something that's going to last as a large scale application. Um, so with that in mind, you have to work very hard, very hard to counteract the tendency of the platform to drag you down. You have to build a system, not just an app. The app is what the customer gets, but it's not the only thing you're building. You're building an entire system to prevent your app from becoming an unmaintainable nightmare. Um, and the thing that we're trying to counter is this idea of software entropy. Um, so, okay, what's software entropy? Um, this quote from uh, basically explains it. So as you change, as you grow your system, as you add features, as you refactor things, as you fix bugs or edge cases on some weird phone, you add in just more and more little things. And every little change adds complexity, and every bit of complexity leads to uh, potential problems. So let's start with the simplest thing that you can do with two different views in Android, which is tie together a text view and a layout around it so that they both hide when the text is empty and they both show when the text is not. There's no gotchas in this code. I know you can write this code. I know you have written this code. It works just fine. The problem is, three, four, five months from now, you are not going to be the person modifying this fragment, and that other person might refactor the XML and change one of the ID, uh, IDs on the views, and this code will still compile and will still run, and your XML will still compile and it'll look like what the other guy made it look like, but at the end of the day, you lost this feature, whatever this is. Maybe it's your network warning, maybe it's your, you know, your, your subscription's expiring warning. Whatever this is, you lost that feature and you probably won't notice. Um, and so Michael Feather says, legacy code is code without test. If you don't have a way to find out that you lost that feature, then you basically have exposed yourself to the risk uh, that anything that you or somebody else does in the future will remove that feature. Um, and that happens a lot. So what do I mean by a system? A system includes many components. Obviously the app is the core, and I always think of it, um, you know, like a, like a, like a, a motor on a bench with a test harness on it. You know, if you're into cars, like you've got, you know, all of these things plugged into it. You've got your unit tests, your build, your CI server, um, your functional tests, like all these things poking like a doctor on the patient to make sure that your app that you're sending out to customers um, is the thing you want to send to them. And this whole system has value in and of itself. You need your whole team, including you know, your management, everybody behind it, to prioritize the health of the whole system over just the app. Sometimes that means you're building features that never get to customers, but it's the foundation on which you're building a quality app over the long term. Um, so this is system thinking instead of app thinking. So how is every component that you build, whether it's a screen, or it's your you know, event tracker, or it's you know, some type of login system, or file uploader, camera, every subsystem, how are you going to test that now for the first time and over the course of a whole you know, lifetime of your, of your system? Um, and with that in mind, what leads to the lowest cost over that lifetime? Um, you know, not just what's the fastest way to get out of the door today, what's, what's the cost over the next year? Um, which sometimes leads to some weird conclusions. If there's a great library that does 90% of what you need today, but it makes testing impossible, you can't use that library because it's going to hurt your system. Um, if a tool breaks your CI system and you don't get test reports anymore, that tool is not worthwhile. And that's the case with a lot of the, the testing tools today. They make testing easier, they make CI harder. You know, well, how do you balance that in your system? Um, and that's oftentimes you know, difficult to think about. And, and one thing I'll often get, I'm not gonna really harp on you should test. I know there are some you know, excellent developers that don't necessarily believe that tests really do. So I'm not gonna rehash that whole argument. Um, the one thing I would say is if you agree with the premise that a good quality test suite lowers your total cost of ownership over the course of the project, 
Um, but your argument against it is, yeah, it's all well and good, but I'm in a startup and you know we don't have the time for that. My response to that, having been at a few startups, is that you need to plan for success today. If, if you are not planning for success with your engineering, it doesn't make any sense because any business model in a startup is planning for success financially. So there's no situation in which you fail uh, because you don't have enough customers. You know, so, uh, excuse me, you, you're, you're planning to have a bunch of customers, if you don't get them, you're gonna fail anyway. If you do get them, then you're gonna be around long enough that your tests are gonna matter. So plan for success. Um, if you're not planning for success from day one, it doesn't make any sense. Um, okay, so every component needs a testing strategy. What are the testing strategies you can choose from? If you don't think about this, you get the first testing strategy, which your customers are your test team. Um, you will get you know, bug reports from production, hopefully from bug sets or something like that. Um, worse if they're yelling at you on Twitter or Google Play reviews. Um, but that is your implicit testing strategy if you don't have a testing strategy, and it's the worst one. Um, the one that most people go with is QA testing manually by the team. Um, and we'll get to some of the automated tests. Um, I'm not gonna stand here and say that unit testing is always the answer. Um, I'm going to say that I think most engineers in Android rely too heavily on manual QA testing. Uh, but if you're going with manual testing, let's think about some of the characteristics. Upfront, pretty low cost. You know, somebody wrote a spec for the feature, you know what it should look like. Um, you need to accept and test every feature by hand anyway the first time. So manual testing doesn't have a, a high marginal cost initially. Um, and you're never gonna get rid of it. You know, a year from now, yeah, you're still doing some manual testing. Um, the problem is it becomes completely unsustainable. A year in, you have so many features to test on every release that it takes days and it takes teams and, and it takes people managing teams. Um, and you end up having this, this huge source of friction, and that goes against everything that we know about writing high quality software. Um, so, you know, yes, you can build in debug menus and different types and mock data and all that stuff, and that helps, it makes it more effective, but it's, it's more cost, it's more building. Um, and I'd say the, really, the way that you really get a feel for how expensive manual testing is, try to write specs for it. Go get, you know, Cucumber pulled up. If you're unfamiliar, it's a BDD testing framework for the web. Um, I don't use Cucumber and Android, but I did write the Gherkin syntax spec where, you know, it lays out exactly what every thing, single thing should do in every single situation. And it's awful. Like, if you sit down and write spec for days on end, it's the worst thing that you've ever done as a programmer. But that's what you need to do to catch all the edge cases. And if you're gonna do that, you might as well just write the test. And so if you're not writing the specs, what you're really doing is not manual testing either. Um, you're just kind of ad hoc testing what you can think of every time. Um, so if you write the specs, you'll realize how expensive manual testing is. Um, all right, so then, you know, let's say you're getting to the place, this is typically the road, you do manual testing until it's unsustainable. Uh, then you, you know, get into that situation, you go read, you know, working effectively with legacy code, or you talk to Pivotal Lab or something like that, and they'll say, okay, great. You have a legacy code project, the best way to test it is automated UI testing. Something like Appium, UI Automator. Um, we've been down this road at Guild on our iOS app to some extent. Um, I tried it at the previous company I was at. You can build UI tests that use the accessibility features, um, but they're very flaky. They don't necessarily uh, guarantee you that anything is working when they say they're working. They don't necessarily guarantee that anything's failing when they say they're failing. They're very hard to write um, more than just a few. So other than the fact that they can be layered on later, I don't think that they are the answer. Um, the only area I would probably say it's worthwhile is smoke tests, like have a test against every single screen to make sure every screen can load. It's reasonable. Um, or areas of your app that never change, so maybe changing passwords, signing up, something like that. Um, then you have to functional testing, which is one layer down. You're trying to test the whole component. Uh, actually, most Android unit testing examples are functional tests. And this is, in my opinion, why people say unit testing on Android is very difficult. It's because most people are not unit testing Android. They're functional testing. Uh, all the instrumentation test examples on the Android developer website, activity, you know, service test, the content provider test, those are all functional tests. Um, you're, you're loading a whole fragment or a whole activity, actually you don't even have an example of a fragment test on the, uh, the developer website. You're loading a whole activity, a whole service, something like that. Um, it's going to take a second and a half for every test case, which gets tedious if you have a lot of them. Um, you have to deal with a lot of different stuff. So they have their place. 
but really you want to minimize them uh, because they have their own their own issues. So some of the generic problems on any functional test you have, you know, a synchronous nature of it, network calls, and any activity. Um, and in Android specifically, you've got to deal with the life cycle. So just because you have an activity allocated doesn't mean it's ready to touch the views. Um, you've got context to deal with, and there's the context in the test suite versus the context in the, the bundle that you're testing. Um, and then the platform singletons, whether that's shared preferences, the account manager, uh, the content providers, there's just so many things that are difficult to mock in, even if you're using something like Dagger, that functional tests become very, very expensive in their own right. Um, you know, you can think in theory on writing a test, this is pseudocode. Basically, you've got a set of your preconditions in any test. In a functional test, you need to do a bunch of, you know, wait for the activity to get up there, and then wait for the, you know, data to load out of the network or the fake network or the content provider or the fake content provider. And these are non-trivial steps to write, if you can even write them, but there's still no value boilerplate you're throwing in every functional test. Um, and an example, this is right out of the documentation on the Android website. Everything I've highlighted in pink is boilerplate setup that adds no value to your tests. And everything in green is actually testing is the value in that one text view what I wanted it to be. Um, that's not a good, really, a good use of time, and then there's no wonder why nobody's writing these tests. Um, so again, you've really got to concern yourself a lot of boilerplate and setup time. So I, I really want to say minimize your functional tests. Um, unit testing, on the other hand, I think is, is where the high value is. Um, very narrow in scope, narrower in scope than what they describe um, in the developer docs. You know, you're testing one method at a time, you're not testing the platform, you're testing your own code. Um, you can really refactor the unit test in the same way that you can refactor your own code. Um, and I think this is where the vast majority of your tests should be. And most people I talk to, this is not where the vast majority of your tests are. So I think if you, if you reorient yourself to focus on true unit testing, um, you will you know, end up in a much better maintainable place. Uh, so in theory, you just set your, for any given unit test, you're setting some preconditions, um, and then you're you know, asserting the conditions on the, on the back side. Um, so here's two examples. The first one is simply pulling a model out of uh, JSON and making sure it matches up with what we expect. Um, the second one is um, just some basic tests of like a helper method. Um, you know, pretty simple stuff, but next thing you know, you find out, oh, there's a little bug in how I'm deserializing JSON. Or, uh, this test helper doesn't exactly do what I, I thought it did. Um, so it really helps your base assumptions. Like, you never should think about, does this model parse uh, to and from JSON correctly? You should just know that. You know, and if, you should never worry if some helper works or not. You should just know that it does. Um, so if you don't have those kind of tests, that's very low hanging fruit. Um, okay. I can tell by the way everyone's looking at me that I think a lot of you are like, yeah, I know that. Like, I know, I need unit tests, great. Uh, why don't we all have unit tests? Because I started out, you know, coming from Rails and saying, like, why is there no TDD in Android? And I spent, you know, six months banging my head into the wall, and I realized it's, it's not because people don't want these things. It's because it's really hard. Um, and I think that, you know, really, it just, it's difficult necessarily looking at a lot of the Android code out there, whether it's on you know, the official documentation and some of the official open source apps, even on GitHub. There's just not a lot of people that have uh, shown how to effect the unit test. So I think a lot of people are looking for the nitty gritty how to, how to actually do this. Um, and I thought about it for a long time, and I started with, okay, why is it easy to write unit tests against models? The first solution I came up with is show all the logic in the models, and then it's easy to test, fat model strategy. And it's like, okay, why is that easy? It's easy because if you write the typical Android app, almost everything extends from a platform component. Everything is so-and-so activity, so-and-so fragment, so-and-so adapter, um, except your models. Your models are like the one pojo that you get in your app that you don't like have a parent from Google that is just doing a bunch of things that you don't necessarily want going on the whole time. So then I started thinking maybe the answer here is just you know, divorce Android as much as we can. Um, move our business logic away from the platform and test it you know, over here, which isn't necessarily the most novel idea, um, but if you really start like, forcing that, um, you'll end up in a much, much more testable state. So today I'm gonna talk specifically about a few strategies, um, uh, key value stores using shared preferences, um, and then on the UI layer, view models, presenters, and custom views. I'm specifically not going to talk about network calls, 
um, and anything in a database. I think each one of those topics is an hour in and of itself, and I don't necessarily have the answers on, on those yet either. Um, so, that demo app I talked about before, it's a very simple app. Um, it's basically a weather station on a weather buoy. It's actually an app I'm working on uh, for fun. And it shows you know, a list of different buoys, and then if you click on one, you can see basically the forecast at that moment at that time. So pretty simple master detail kind of thing. And the user gets to choose if they want different uh, unit systems. So you can check that out on GitHub. Um, it gives you a little context for some of these examples. Um, and I specifically avoided using some of the more like advanced tools. Um, so it uses only the standard J unit stuff. The only things I added uh, were Makito. I really couldn't get by without it. Um, and I tried Assert J, which is one of Jake Warren's new testing tools. Um, very easy to bring in. Just changed the syntax a little. But I didn't use Expresso, Roboelectric, or Dagger. Um, those are great tools, and I use them. Uh, but I think they raised the barrier, and everyone you know, has trouble integrating Gradle and Roboelectric and Espresso and all those things at once. And it, then it turns into like, well, I can't make the build system work, so I can't use any of these tools. So this talk and this example really shows that you don't need any fancy tools. You just need to refactor a bit um, how you're laying out your application. Um, so the first thing is shared preferences. Shared preferences, I assume everyone's you know, familiar with. Um, it's a pretty simple API, you'll find it littered everywhere, uh, and yet it also causes a lot of bugs. Does anyone here see the bug in this code? This one's actually a gotcha. Also a test to see if anyone's still winning. Um, anybody? Apply is asynchronous. True, but not necessarily. Uh, the issue. Uh, I'll, I'll show right here. And this is funny because I have made this mistake, and I've seen other people make this mistake. These are different files. We wrote one, we wrote the, uh, the value here into one file and we're reading it from another. And since you give it a default, you often never know that this has happened because you don't get a crash. You just don't necessarily get the setting that you saved. So, you're, you know, your typical QA, you're like backing around the app really quick and maybe you forgot what you set it to last time, so you don't know and it works fine, so great. And then you get a bug report from someone who says, hey, I can't put your app in the metric system anymore. And you go digging for it and you can't figure out why, and it's because you've saved the person setting it, you know, into one file and you're reading from another one. Um, extremely common pitfall. And if you don't have a strategy for this, someone can come along six months from now and refactor your shared preferences and miss one, or maybe somebody's working on a branch, refactoring it, someone's working on another branch, adding new features, and when they both get merged in, there's no merge conflicts, everything seems to work fine, but now you're writing to two different files. Um, so if that doesn't scare you about a lot of, because I know you've got shared preference you know, calls littered throughout your fragments, um, I don't know how to do it. So my answer is wrap shared preferences. Only have one place in your app where you actually deal with that file. Um, give it a nice API, simple getters and setters. This is a bunch of boilerplate. Sorry, um, like I went back to in the beginning, we're not measuring this this system by the weight, you know, weight of it just based on lines of code. So yeah, there's some boilerplate, but at the end of the day, there's only one place that you're accessing shared preferences, and that that prevents you from writing to new files. It also helps you if you have to deal with schema changes from one version to another, um, which is another problem with shared preferences often. So. We'll start by just wrapping it um, as shown here. And then we'll write a functional test to make sure that it reads and writes from the files you'd expect. But thankfully now there's only one functional test um, as opposed to before where you kind of needed it everywhere. Um, the nice thing is wherever you use it, you don't need to worry about if it's in shared preferences or some other key value store or however you go about implementing saving these preferences is not the problem of anybody other than the person maintaining that component. Single responsibility principle you know, that's all well and good. Um, but even better, in your other tests throughout your code, you no longer need to inject values into shared preferences. So you can have factories that provide uh, different values out of the key value store and pass them into your other unit tests, which makes the other tests easier and prevents bugs on reading and writing to shared preferences. Um, so overall, pretty simple stuff. Um, other than a little bit more code, there's really no downside to it. Um, I've been using it effectively for a while now, and then you can start getting into, you know, should we split into a bunch of different shared preference wrappers and things like that. Um, but pretty straightforward, we've just pushed Android out. Okay. 
The UI is a lot more difficult to unit test, um, but it's not impossible. Um, the first, first strategy I want to talk about is using custom views to create a better API. Obviously, custom views to create things that you can't do with the normal views is the normal, uh, is the thing that you typically think of custom views for. Um, but I actually use a lot of custom views just to um, wrap a typical behavior. So going back to that, you know, showing and hiding a section on the screen when the text is there. Um, this kind of code is typically written in a fragment or activity to manipulate views from the outside. Uh, but that means it's one, duplicated everywhere. Um, two, if you want to test it, you need to test the fragment or activity. Um, there is no three, but you know, sorry. So what happens when we refactor this layout? Um, how do we know this doesn't break? Things I was talking about before. Um, far better to stick it in a view. So the bottom, the bottom block of code here is uh, basically moving that logic onto an extension of a, of a I guess, a frame layout, a relative layout, whatever you want. Um, but one layer above that, I think you should have an interface for this behavior rather than actually just putting it on a concrete class because once you have it on one class, you'll probably want it on a bunch of classes. Um, and actually having a bunch of interfaces for the behavior reviews, again, going to your unit testing, now you can pass in mock versions of these interfaces rather than concrete view classes and start testing your behavior against these kind of interfaces. Um, and you'll see a couple examples of that in a demo project. Um, and so these are functional tests uh, against the custom view to ensure that it does what we want. These are using assert J, that's the uh, assert that is visible kind of stuff, um, but you could write them without assert J if you wanted to. Um, but now you can be sure your custom text view adheres to your interface very, very simply. Um, so this is another example that I used in the demo. Sorry, the UI is pretty terrible, but the uh, you know, it's simple, a couple text views in a, in a layout, and you could just litter these through your fragment, but why not extract them into a custom view with a nice API and, and really find a way to um, make things much cleaner. So, uh, the only negative of custom views, you, you kind of have a composability issue if you have a lot of, you know, you have to subclass a lot of different uh, Android classes to really get there. Um, there's really not too much you can do about that, but I think that the clean API is generally, generally worth it. Um, all right, the next one that I want to talk about starts, we're starting to get a little bit weirder. Uh, view models, which you may have heard of, um, is really about making your fragment not the middle of the spaghetti that is your UI. So if you, if you, whether you use fragments or activities, put either one in the middle, but your, your fragment ends up being the gatekeeper to everything in normal, this is a normal application, right? Shared preferences, your API, your different models, all the different views, it just glues everything together, pulls data from over here, and checks against this, you got a bunch of if statements, I'm sure, you, you set the views to do some other things, and oh, by the way, fragments are the absolute hardest thing to test. Um, so you put your most complicated logic in the hardest thing to test. That's definitely not a good situation. Um, so a view model, really, you want to pull that logic out of the fragment into something that is testable, um, especially if there's you know, presentation logic above and beyond the model, or you're combining multiple models. Um, but the, in my definition of a view model, they have no concept of the uh, activity fragment lifecycle, and they have no reference to the view, which is in contrast to uh, the presenter that I'll show later. Um, so the fragment still has a lot of work to do. It's responsible for network calls, it's responsible for threading, it's responsible for binding the views and passing them to the view model. Um, but the view model holds your business logic. Um, and the nice thing about this, you basically start thinking, the fragment is there just to glue uh, the data and the views to your view model. So if your networking code is broken, it's broken all the time. If your data loading layer is broken, it's broken all the time. So a very simple um, manual QA process, you open the screen, did it load the data? If it did, okay, great. Then I know my you know, network loading process is working. I don't necessarily need a test for that. But then the view model handles all the edge cases. Um, so what are those edge cases? Presentation logic, if you've got something like a status that, you know, shows a number and at a certain value it changes colors. It doesn't really belong in the model um, because it's it's like a, how you actually present that kind of thing. If you've got a machine readable date in the model but you want to turn it into a fuzzy human readable, you know, that, that tweet was sent five minutes ago, that's in your view model, it's not really in your view. Um, that's debatable, you can go with a thick model strategy. Um, 
your internationalization, those kind of things. But where I think they really shine is combining a bunch of models. And this isn't necessarily taking two full-fledged JSON objects and merging them, because you could argue, you know, why don't we just do that on the server? A lot of times it's about merging um, the model that is your user with the model that represents data. So a lot of code in a fragment ends up basically looking like if the user's logged in to the account, show this set of stuff. The user's logged out, show this set of stuff. So what you're really doing there is combining two model objects, one for the account, one for the data, and, and showing different things on the screen as a result. And when you start getting to those situations, the view model spitting out things that look nothing at all like the, uh, the models it's combining. Um, actually, this this slide actually starts making me think about Rx Java and like reactive and that kind of stuff too. It's a little interesting, but the view model is almost like the object-oriented way of doing that same combination uh, operation. Um, so, what does your architecture start looking like if you use view models? The view model is aware of all the different models, but your fragment really isn't. You, you've pushed, you know, back to Android to arm's length. You're literally pushing Android off the screen here, so that all it is is the setup around your view model. Um, so, in my case, a really nice view model setup uh, is having immutable models. Um, so, you'll note there's no reference to the view at all here. Um, all of the inner models are immutable. You just basically, at the end of every uh, network call or fetch, you um, create a new view model, and then you update your views accordingly. Um, so, the syntax on the bottom half of this is very interesting. Not syntax, just the design here. Um, from the perspective of the, view, the uh, views, I pass each view individually to the view model to be updated in one method. And that view is held within the view model for only the scope of that method. Therefore, the view model doesn't need to know about any, and doesn't need to know anything about lifecycle considerations because you know you're basically you're on the main thread. It only holds it for one one uh, you know scope, and it's not an issue. The other thing here is that. Whatever you're doing the view model to that view, you can change that without changing this bit of code that ties the view model to the frag. So again, the goal here is that every time you change your business logic in the view model, you're not actually risking breaking your fragment, and it's easy to test your fragment, um, you know, basically through the main path. Uh, the view model, any business logic you want. Um, the key point here is you get past the instrument is one of the custom views I made. You're past the custom view. You use your business logic in this case, um, applying you know the user's preference on unit system to the underlying data in the model, and then we uh, update that view, and we, we don't keep a reference to the view. Um, so absolutely don't keep a reference to the view because then you'll have a context leak. Um, the other pitfall is basically putting a bunch of getters on your view model, and that leads you to basically have to in every single case that you want to modify a property of a view, you need to have that line of code in your fragment, which means that now, when you want to change your business logic, not only do you modify the view model, you also modify the fragment, which is defeating the whole purpose. Um, and that's why you, that like, kind of way I was passing the views in um, is a subtle but important point in this whole thing. Um, so this is not an exaggeration on the 100% part, so this is test code coverage on the example app. 100% um, test coverage on the view model is actually trivial. There are no gimmicks in that. Um, and this is how all of our production code at Guild looks right now. The view model is all 100% test coverage, easily. Uh, if I used Expresso, I would have more than 0% on the other ones. But the, uh, it's very trivial to test them. So that's, that's very ideal. They have a narrow use case, though, because nowhere in there was any way to have interaction coming from the user. They're basically displaying data um, they don't really work in collections, um, so they have their uses, detailed views, things like that, but they don't, they don't work in all cases. Um, so, presenters. Presenters are basically the same idea as the view model. You want to pull your business logic out of the fragment or activity, but this one has a persistent reference to the view. So, whereas the view model, you're basically creating them at the end of every network call or load or callback or whatever. The presenters, I generally think of them as something that you know sticks around for the whole lifetime of the fragment. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the fragment and the presenter. Um, that's my distinction between view model and presenter. It, it follows the general contours, but there is a lot of debate about that. Um, so that makes the complexity of the presenter much, much greater than the view model. Um, I typically recommend try the view models on first, 
for presenters. I can't say that I'm necessarily 100% sold on everything I'm doing with presenters here. I keep oscillating on a bit. Um, you have to coordinate your presenter with the activity life cycle because there's going to be periods of time when the presenter exists but it can't call back and touch views. Um, you can potentially leak your context depending on how you create and destroy the presenter. Um, so maybe you even want to move loading data into the presenter. I'm pretty sure that's how the guys at Square are doing it. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure they were describing their presenters the last meetup I was at as something that actually basically does everything and gets injected in with Dagger. So that's, that's even further than what I'm describing here. Um, so you have that same setup where the presenter is aware of the models, hiding it from the fragment. But unlike the other one, um, the presenter actually knows about the view. And typically, you have an interface that defines all the things that the view, the view being the whole screen, unfortunately it's you know, the little views versus the big view, but the view interface is the entire screen and everything on it. Um, and then your fragment implements that interface, and so the presenter is generally aware of the interface, but not the concrete fragment class. Um, so, in your fragment, I generally create the presenter right off the bat. Write the constructor before you even get to on create. Um, and then you know you can use on resume, on pause, on start, on stop, whatever your system is. You need to set the view of the presenter to point to the fragment so it's aware of it. Um, so that's the connection from the perspective of the fragment on the life cycle. From the presenter side, you're okay. You've been creating the constructor of the fragment. You cannot call back to the fragment yet. So what's your callback? Um, I typically have a, a static inner class that implements that that screen interface that just swallows any calls back which can be dangerous, but is better than null pointer exceptions and context leaks and all those things. Um, so this, is, this gets a little hairy, but I think it, it ends up working out. I actually haven't had like crashes from this. It just requires a lot of reasoning. Um, and then now in the fragment, you can do things like pass your on clicks, your uh, on list item, you know, selected, on long, all, all. You can basically take all of your um, user interactions and delegate them to the presenter. Um, so it's just a straight pass through with a little bit of data in all those cases. And then when you think about the test that you're going to write for the presenter, um, you can just simulate the on-click events by instantiating the presenter with a mock uh, screen interface and then exercising all of the methods that you would be exercising from your fragment. Um, and from inside the presenter, you, know, you receive that call, you do whatever business logic you want, but note at the end, you're calling back to your long-lived reference to the screen interface rather than an individual view that was passed in. The region here is a piece of data, not a view. Um, so again, all your business logic is in the presenter, you can test all of it. Um, so in the example application, the detail view uses the view model pattern because we're just showing data about a simple object. And then in the master list where you select which uh, thing you want to view, and that uses the presenter pattern because there's user interaction. Um, so the presenter is very good for any case where you have heavy user interaction. Um, and ideally what you really want to do is, is test the connection between your um, fragment and your presenter using something like Espresso or implementation test so that you're sure that um, your UI is actually exercising the presenter the way that you expect. Um, and that, that should handle those cases. Um, so, number one point, even if you don't necessarily agree with the way I've gone about doing this, is that you need to have a plan from early on about how you're going to make sure that your system is maintainable over the long term. Um, and keeping in mind that the the cost of testing is expensive in dollars over, over a period of time. It's also expensive in opportunity cost. You know, when you're a year in and you're bogged down in refactoring and bugs and, and QA and not releasing, that's expensive. It's also preventing you from building the things that will add features for your users and gain you revenue. So it's expensive in, in you know, the obvious way, but actually the insidious opportunity cost might be worse. Um, so my solution for reducing these costs, uh, a lot of testing, and by keeping the platform at arm's length through these kind of solutions and others, you make the test more maintainable. Um, and I, I think that that has been the way that I've found so far to really uh, make this work a lot better for us. Uh, so in my opinion, the best book on this, uh, Uncle Bob's uh, Agile Principle of Pattern Practice in C-Sharp. I read a lot of C-Sharp books for some reason. Um, I don't know. I think at the end of the day, we're back in like the early 2000s making back client applications, and a lot of these, uh, a lot of the books written for C-sharp are very relevant. There's a couple 
um, on testing that are great too. Martin Fowler has this article specifically on UI architectures that goes through a bunch of the ones that everyone banged their heads against the wall in the 90s over. Um, and all of these problems also exist in iOS. Um, and the magazine Objective CIO, um, they have an entire issue about this problem because they have they call it the fat view controller problem. You have the fragment problem, they have the fat view control problem. It's the exact same problem. Um, and there was a nice article in there about the Viper architectural pattern, which is view, interactor, presenter, entity, and routing. So they go even crazier than I do. Um, but there was some good, good stuff in there. I think there's also in that part, in that, um, that specific issue an article about view models as well. Um, so if you're interested in anything else, I'm on Twitter. Um, I have a blog that I try to write about some of these things and the demo app exists and I'm hoping to not abandon it. Um, I actually intend to continue building it. So I'd like to um, work on that. So definitely get in touch if you have questions. And I'll take questions now if anyone has any questions now. So I actually, I've been through that once, and it was actually, uh, I switched from Android to iOS for a couple months to help out. Um, and so I came up, not came up with, but there was a, a decent plan of attack we had. So the first step is, you know, clean out all your dead code. If there's any dead code, unacceptable. Um, start there, then go into, uh, I actually like starting with unit tests on the models and the helpers, because they're, they're like I said, they're disconnected from everything. Um, if you get all your models and all your helpers into a place where you're certain that they're correct, um, then you can kind of rationalize when you're debugging about everything. It's difficult when you're in a, in a, in a large pile of code um, and you're like going through the debugger, you basically have to make a set of assumptions and generally the real, the real painful bugs is because one of the assumptions that you're making is incorrect. So I have to think of the unit test as a way of proving your assumptions. Um, so, okay, clean out your dead code, go in, put uh, unit tests on the existing models and your helpers, and then I should try and move logic into the models wherever possible. Um, and then you have to make a judgment call on whether the existing uh, fragments are worth saving or not. Um, and that's, that's really dependent on the quality of the code. Um, so I would start with the unit test low level, and then if you wanted to bring in the UI test on the top level, but I actually often found it easier to write, rewrite like one screen at a time from the fragment layer up to the UI, and then have good testing on that. Um, took about the same amount of time as doing automated UI testing. Uh, but I usually find bottom up. Um, and there's a, there's a trade-off between the easiest thing to test and the most important thing to test. And I think that the easiest thing to test is where you should start. So you just start building that confidence. Um, you start building this the whole concept of uh, testability. A lot of times having the test on day one, like I always start with the test for everything I write, and I don't always have good tests in it right away. But just having a place where you can go add a test, as soon as you run into, oh, that's a weird edge condition, I should probably add a test for that. When you go in and the test case exists, and the setup method's there to create an object already, and all you gotta do is add one case, you'll do it. If the first time you run into something you need to test, you need to create all those things, you probably won't. Um, so that's right. Um, How do you uh, prevent yourself from being overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem? Like, you know, um, so you really need to make sure that you clear uh, the reference from the presenter to the fragment in the lifecycle methods of the fragment. And unfortunately, there's no way to do that other than purely like doing it, you can't put it in a base class, you have to do it and you have to check it, and it's just one of those things that you have an area of risk that everyone needs to be aware of. Um, the way I avoid uh, like no where issues is by uh, basically having that no operation callback uh, from the presenter that swallows all the calls of the fragment that don't exist. Um, so then there's an expectation that at certain points in time the presenter exists but it has no reference to a fragment. Um, and this way you're not like, you're not locking yourself to an instance of the fragment that's now off screen. Um, any other questions?
All right, well, uh, thanks again. Um,